Hello and welcome back to the podcast. As always, I will thank you for listening. And if you like what I do, please share with a friend, leave a comment. And if you have time, leave a review uh, of what I do. All support is always appreciated. And if you want me to make an episode about a subject you like, please send me a message and I will make that happen. The last episode was number 10. So today I wanted to do a little bit of a special episode because one of my big passions are movies. I have always loved movies and the production and creation around them because a good movie can make you laugh, feel sad, anger and motivate you. I don't know how many times I have watched Rocky and then get super pumped to go and train for example or just watching the Lord of the Rings for example that is one of the best trilogies ever made and having all the feelings around those movies but the process from ID to silver screen is a long and hard way not only you need to have a good story first of all you need to have a studio to pick it up or the money to produce it yourself through crowdfunding or having people investing in it and even after that you have to navigate studio politics you need to have good writers uh, you need to uh, see over the production issues and get the actors to make it work and when it comes to productions of course you need locations you need to decide where you're going with the practical or have CGI effects you need sounds camera and of course you need people to operate this to be able to know what they're doing so today I was thinking that we're going to take a look at a couple of examples where trouble on set affected the final product uh, for better or for worse depending how you look at it I hope you find this episode entertaining and thank you for being with me on this journey so far the first one we are going to take a look at is the death of Oliver Reed and in the year 2000 we got the epic sword and sandals movie gladiator starring Russell Crowe and directed by Ridley Scott I have no idea how many times I have actually seen this movie and I like it as much as I did when I saw it for the first time when I was a kid and uh, we all kind of know about the guy in the jeans walking out of friend uh, walking out of frame when Maximus is petting his horse and more is the inner historian in me have a kind of a big problem how they depict Uh, how the Romans fight in the opening battle Uh, they should have been throwing their pilos before clashing with the barbarians and they should not be breaking formations that um, that is something they usually did not do so um, well that's my inner historian coming forth but that is not what I'm going to talk about I I mean it's a excellent movie in, in, in all the other aspects but During the movie, we meet the former gladiator and now gladiator school owner Proximo. Playing Proximo is a man called Oliver Reed. And Mr. Reed was a British actor and had been active in movies since the 1960s. And according to the man himself, more than an actor, he had been a boxer, a bouncer, and he had served his obligatory time in the British Army and one thing that followed Oliver Reed through his career was his heavy drinking he claims that in one sitting over a two-day bender have downed 106 pints of beer before the marriage to his second wife and during a legendary pub crawl with Steve McQueen in the 1970s he apparently got so drunk he threw up all over Mr. McQueen dusted himself off and kept going 
He also was a close friend and a drinking buddy with the drummer of The Who, uh, Keith Moon. And if you pay attention in the movie, you can see that on his face are a couple of scars. And that is from a bar brawl in 1963 that required 53 stitches to his face. Oliver Reed promised director Ridley Scott to not drink during filming and production of Gladiator, but he kind of worked around this by only drinking during the weekends. So, on location in Malta in 1999, where um, a big portion of the scenes for Gladiator was shot, uh, Reed encountered a group of sailors from a British frigate in a pub. They had anchored in Malta during, I guess, military exercises or patrol or something. And they challenged Mr. Reed to a drinking contest and he accepted. And after some times and a lot of drink, he claimed to not be feeling that well. So he was going to go to the bathroom. He managed to walk a couple of steps and fell to the floor. And ambulance was called and he was pronounced dead in uh, the ambulance on the way to the hospital and the cause of death was heart attack most likely brought upon himself from all the drinking so this forced the production to use uh, cgi and a body double to complete the scenes were uh, that were left for uh, mr reed in the movie and after they did this they were able to patch his scenes together and lay it so all the scenes would work for him and if you watch the movie to the end you can see that there is uh, a tribute to Mr. Reed at the end of the credits so next one we're gonna look at is the death of Brandon Lee and in 1994, we got the movie The Crow. And if you're around my own age, you maybe saw this movie a little bit later on VHS or later on DVD. And if you are young enough to know what VHS are, welcome. If you don't, Google. The tragedy around this movie, however, comes from the accidental death of its main actor, Brandon Lee the son of legendary movie star and martial, martial arts legend Bruce Lee. Uh, Brandon had at the time several movies under his belt and was considered at the time a rising star in Hollywood. He had already starred in movies like Rapid Fire in 1992 and Showdown in Little Tokyo opposite Dolph Lundgren in 1991. His performance in The Crow received praise and the movie was a big, big success. Uh, for what happened that fateful day on the set was a combination of poor knowledge of firearms, stress and neglect by the production team. And Brandon was supposed to get shot by a prop gun during filming. However, this was a revolver and they used two types of fake bullets for this gun. One of the bullets are, if you imagine a bullet, but you take out the gunpowder and the primer, so it's, a, it's an empty shell with a bullet on top. So when you have a revolver and you have a close-up on the revolver, it looks like real bullets inside of it. And the second type of bullet is a classic dummy round that it... Uh, when you fire it produces um, a bang and some fire so it looks like it's shooting but nothing comes out of the, the barrel so what happened then well during production uh, one actor or a prop gun assistant fired the gun and somehow a bullet got jammed in the barrel and when they were time to shoot the scene where uh, Brandon was going to be shot 
he uh, they did not check the gun properly so they didn't see that there was something in the barrel so when they had a, a dummy round behind this uh, this uh, lodged bullet when it fired it produced enough force to get launched out of the barrel and struck Brandon in the abdomen so he um, following this day on shooting the prop guy was actually not there and it was assistant handling the gun so uh, lack of experience this assistant again he did not check the barrel so the actor um, that got the gun Michael Massey uh, he shot Brandon for real and Brandon was pronounced dead when he arrived at the hospital because getting struck st- struck in the abdomen made it so he uh, I believe the the official cause of death was that he died from internal bleedings because of the bullet wound so Michael Massey the actor that shot him he took a year off acting he just went home and just stayed there and he actually have never seen the movie uh, he uh, claimed in an interview uh, in 2005 that he still has nightmares about this and he would never get over what happened and I believe he took this uh, very hard even to his death uh, when he passed away a couple of years ago from I believe it was stomach cancer but this was a tragic mistake that cost a life and I can only imagine being the prop guys and have to live with that mistake that they did not use this um, time to check the gun properly so yeah, yeah tragedy next one is a little bit lighter it's in a sense it it's uh, the conqueror and in 1956 a movie had premiere that had gone down in infamy of being so bad that it's kind of hard to explain uh, the film is about a young uh, Genghis Khan and his meeting with his wife Bortai he falls in love with her and she gets kidnapped and he takes her back and conquers the Tartars and I mean it sounds pretty interesting indeed but I am sorry to tell you that this is on the list of the 50 worst movies of all time and why is that well first of all Genghis Khan is played by John Wayne in a horrible horrible miscast role opposite Susan Hayward as Bortai uh, John Wayne if you don't know who he is, is and was an American movie icon and he is I mean in some roles he is a good actor I mean his his Oscar for um, I think his best best performance in True Grit he deserved that but to play a Mongolian warlord Genghis Khan he can't not only is he not remotely Asian to begin with but he is acting between being I don't know a village idiot and like a cowboy or something a sheriff maybe and the dialogue is absolutely terrible with poor delivery and kind of weird lines but so if you want a good evening take a look for it and be you know be drunk and you will kind of enjoy it but I need to give it its due because the good parts of the movie are uh, its scope it it was produced by philanthropist Howard Hughes and the budget was absolutely there and filming is beautiful and it's um, the practical practical effects with all the horses are really beautiful to look at they brought in uh, <clears throat> around uh, 300 native americans to film the riding and battle scenes so it's a lot of people knowing what they are doing so it, it looks for the most part quite good the controversial thing though about the movie uh, more than the bad casting and and acting is where they filmed it because many of the scenes was filmed in the utah desert 
and the location they chose was 137 miles, about 220 kilometers downwind from a nuclear testing site. The Nevada National Security Site was a place where they did around 100 nuclear tests between 1951 to 1962, and this made the area ripe with radiation. And the, f the interesting thing is the studio knew about this, and they filmed anyway, and they actually f followed the guidelines set by the health department. So the health department was the guys that told them that this would, yeah, you know, this is this is fine, this is fine. There's no following thing for this. So following this of the 220 crew members 91 developed cancer and of these 91 41 of them died of cancer relating disease both leads john wayne and susan hayward died later in life in cancer Susan Hayward died by a brain tumor in 1975 and John Wayne of stomach cancer in 1964. However, that cancer, uh, as I understand it, it started in his lungs. And if all these cancer related deaths were solely by the effects of the filming, it's not really guaranteed uh, because different doctors have said different things. But we do have to take into consideration of the uh, lifestyle of the time also. Because John Wayne, he was known as a heavy smoker. And in the 50s, it wasn't really that much of a big deal that everybody smoked all the time. And, you know, healthy living, I don't know. He, he was famous for uh, drinking and smoking. So, you know... Yeah. In the end, though, uh, it must have been a factor for the involved because um, heavy radiation affects everything around it. I mean, look at Chernobyl, look at Pripyat. Uh, people don't live there because of radiation. And even if you, I'm not, a, I'm not a doctor, so I don't know. But even if you uh, try to uh, disregard the radiation uh, i mean it should have a big effect and the fact that uh, 91 of 220 developed cancer i mean that is not good odds so the lesson here i would say is not film next to a nuclear testing site maybe the next thing we are going to take a look at is a helicopter crash that occurred in 1982 uh, during the filming of the Twilight Zone and the movie and the Twilight Zone for people that don't know was a long-going television series between 1959 and 1964 and this was the inspiration for the movie of course and it was produced by John Landis and Steven Spielberg and the Twilight Zone the series has been a big inspiration for a lot of creators um, I think the Simpsons are very heavy influence from it and a lot of jokes in in movies comes uh, from the Twilight Zone I mean it's, uh, it's a, a famous bit in the Twilight Zone where William Shatner sees something on the wing of a plane and things like that so the movie is lined up for in four different stories and its uh, release was a big success and made back its its budget and more and in the first story is where our accident take place and we meet uh, in the first story the ca character of Bill Connor played by Wick uh, Morrow and the easiest way to describe him in, in the movie is that he's a he's a racist and a bigot that don't like anyone he doesn't like the blacks he doesn't like the jews he doesn't like asian people everything so he sits in a bar and complains about uh, minorities and drinking heavily and he um, gets as asked to leave and when he leaves he gets swept up in a time travel because he arrives in nazi germany suddenly and 
the story follows uh, kind of a uh, Ebenezer Scrooge like character arc that he gets to go to different places and face his own bigotry to uh, help people that he don't don't really like and in one part of this story he is brought back to the Vietnam War and it's here the accident on the set took place and the total scene has been re-edited so the helicopter scene is no longer uh, included in the movie uh, he in the end he is, saves two children and runs off and this was supposed to be that he runs to a helicopter and flies off but during the filming of the scenes uh, he um, the, the the helicopter was flying down and there was a miscommunication between uh, the director and the, the pyrotechnics guys so when the helicopter comes down and is hovering and Bill Connor or Vic Morrow with the two kids are running towards it uh, they blow up pyrotechnics to simulate fireballs and stuff and one struck the tail rotor and the other one uh, second explosion blinded the pilot so bad so the hovering helicopter spun out of control and crashed and Vic was carrying the two children and was crossing uh, a pond of water when the helicopter came down and landed on top of all three of them and this is going to be a little bit brutal but Vic Morrow and the girl actor Maisha Din Lee he, they were decapitated by uh, the rotor and the the boy child actor Rennie Shinjin Shen was crushed uh, when the helicopter landed on, on, on him and all three thank god died instantly so the following investigation of the accident showed that the child actors were actually oh, they were illegally hired and the reason they were illegal was because the law of movie making at the time prohibited children acting during the night and in the area of explosions and this was children I think it was below 10 years so both John Aldis and the studio stood trial for involuntary manslaughter but they were acquitted however they paid a uh, kind of a big settlement to Vic Morrow's children and to the families of the two children that died and in light of the accident new rules and regulations was drafted to um, prevent accidents in the future uh, for scenes like this so and they redrafted some safety concerns also so films could be made in a safer way when it came to oh, well helicopters and explosions so we now come to the last chapter of today's episode and this may be uh, a little bit of a lighter thing uh, and i have uh, called this samurai cop is it a crime against humanity and well the following movie did not have any accidents or death during production uh, no more than just you know killing the careers of all involved and I thought we would end on a more lighthearted note and the movie Samurai Cop it came on my radar when I was at uh, university and me and a couple of friends we used to have nights where we saw uh, bad movies and had a couple of drinks and Samurai Cop was I must say was our magnum opus evening the movie is a direct to DVD movie that came out in 1991 and it was heavy inspired from the success of the Lethal Weapon uh, series however more than casting uh, a white and a black cop as an odd partner pairing uh, it doesn't have really much more to do with the Lethal Weapon series and Matthew Carderas is our main man called Joe Marshall and his partner is played by Frank Washington and 
An interesting thing is that Matthew uh, or Matt Carderas was a former bodyguard to Sylvester Stallone, and he uh, he wanted to make it as an actor himself, and he went to Los Angeles to to become a star, and he acted in I think one movie, uh, or not a big movie, but he got a tip to meet a director called Am- Amir Shervan. So he went to him in 1990 and more or less got cast as the main uh, character and handed the script uh, immediately upon meeting him. And they started shooting a week after meeting. And Amir Shervan was the guy that wrote, directed and produced the movie. And when they started, this is where all the problems of the movie began. Uh, because the budget for this thing officially has been listed as around seven thousand dollars, so there were a lot of things needed to go uh, go their way for the movie to work. But one thing you realize when when watching this is that all scenes occur during the day, and the re- uh, reason for this was that Amir he could not afford lights for shooting on uh, during the night, so. All the scenes are shot during the day, and actors were, and the actors were <coughs> needed to wear their own clothes and actually use their own cars. And one other thing, if you pay attention, is that this—it's the same prop guns over and over again. It just gets swaps between characters, and this was once again because they couldn't afford any more prop guns. So, a main man, Matthew, he was. And not really trained in weapons training. He had some what we would call today MMA training, but he was not trained in like movie fighting. So they had um, a brilliant fight uh, fight choreographer called George Okatama that was on and playing one of the bad guys. Uh, So he was forced to like improvise all the fight scenes, and Amir was a really bad director. So they just kind of went for it every time they had a, a fight scene. Uh, and he has said himself in interviews that sometimes they, they, they just did a 15 minute walkthrough before uh, before a scene. And um, then just, you know, tried to fight. Uh, so many of the fight scenes are really, really bad. And next a problem during shooting was that Matthew, he thought that he was done. So he has very long hair in the movie, and when he heard by Amir, uh, when they talked once, that, are we done? And he was like, yeah, sure. So he went home, and his uh, manager or agent at the time, he told him like, well, you know, now you have this reel from this movie, you should cut your hair uh, to have shorter hair. So he did that. Then Amir called, and told him to get back so he met him and Amir flipped out because now suddenly he didn't have long hair so they were gonna force to do a lot of reshoots so they went out and got him a wig however they found a women's wig for him and if you look at the scenes it's really really evident in some of the scenes that he is wearing a wig and another thing in this movie I have to point out when you watch it it's it's the women in the movie they are they are some but they have kind of like one function and they are more or less just f dolls i mean this is this is this cannot be understood and this is because of the bad bad dialogue and just directing and one character is a a female cop the only thing like the only thing she talks about is just sleeping with everybody and i'm not even exaggerated it's it's the only thing she does and if you want to watch just a little bit of this go on youtube and just type in samurai cop nurse and i will leave you with that and in the category of money the movie gain a cult so, uh, following so the movie wasn't wasn't like premiered like all other movies 
it just got sold to a studio and they kind of released it on DVD. So the total profits from it is $384,000. So, you know, when you have a budget of 7,000, I mean, that is kind of a good, good thing, I guess. And it, as I said, it was not well, well received, but it has garnered a cult following. And this actually resulted in a sequel, Samurai Cop Vengeance, that came out in 2015 and was actually largely crowdfunded. And um, the funny thing is that a lot of rumors online was that uh, the main actor, Matthew, that he died, that he was dead. So his daughter saw clips of the movie because Matthew he thought that this movie was never gonna see the light of day so he according to himself did not really know that clips of the movie or the entire movie was online so his daughter saw this and also found the rumor that he was dead so he actually made a a YouTube video with the help of his daughter where he addresses the situation that he's not dead and this sparked even more uh, cult, cult going so they got even more money for the sequel and they made the sequel so me and my friends we um, watched Samurai Cup 1 and 2 during one evening and it's it's a glorious thing and I know I have been kind of hard on this movie but I have to say that it has a special place in my heart Uh, It's a cult classic for a reason and as I said before this is a movie that you watch with friends and have a drink or two and believe me you will not be disappointed if if you're planning to do something with a couple of friends watch these two movies have a drink eat some snacks and you will have a fantastic evening. So I would like to thank everybody for listening you are great and I I love you and I thank you so much for the support and if as always if you like what you hear please share with a friend give us a give me a review or something and follow on the socials on Instagram on X and on Spotify and keep being awesome until next time bye bye